If you have your Bible open to uh, Luke 1, we're going to kind of pick up and take off where we uh, were last week. We began talking about Zechariah and Elizabeth and having a dream, a dream that they had dreamed for many, many years to have a child. Probably forgot it, but there Zacharias was in the temple offering the burnt offering, the burnt incense unto the Lord. And you know his prayers had to creep in there. You know God was going to do... Uh, some good things in his life, and uh, Gabriel came down and talked to him for a little bit, and everything kind of changed. Everything changed. You know, sometimes this is the Christmas season. I appreciate those that uh, decorated the church yesterday. I appreciate the, the Christmas songs. How many of y'all are in the mood for Christmas carols? Some of y'all on the ropes. I mean, I'm not quite there yet. So, Mark, you're going to have to really rev them up to get me in the Christmas mood, but we can do it. Um, but they, they do. I appreciate the choir singing and uh, getting ready for next Sunday and the, 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 what is it, a brand new hallelujah? All right. I've got a hallelujah, so y'all teach me a new one. That'll be good. I appreciate those that are working in children's church today. I appreciate those that are working with the nursery. I went down and peeked in on them, got me a water. For those that are in the preschool, they're having fun. I mean, Rick got up and said, Merry Christmas to all. And when I get up to preach, I want to say, and to all a good night. <laughs> Y'all just go to sleep. But this is Christmas time. It's the time of the advent, the arrival. It's the time of uh, God's gift of love for us. It's God's dream. This is what he wanted. God didn't need anything. He is the eternal sovereign God. He has no beginning. At some point in time, he said, you know, I'll create some, some uh, angels to worship. The angels and the archangels, the cherubim, the seraphim, they were there. And they had the opportunity to be very much in the presence of God. And even then... Some sin. And he, before he even created the heavens and the earth, said that he would make us. He had a dream for us. He had a plan for us. He had a de desire for us. I, I love Jeremiah. You know the one that so many often quote, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans that I have for you. Did y'all know God has plans for you? Specifically and individually, he has plans for you. As a matter of fact, he said plans for good and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. But in that same book, in, in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, he said, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. That kind of just knocks in the head all the people who believe in abortion, doesn't it? They say that they're, they're just a, a fetus, they're not a life, they're not a, they're not a real child. I mean... God's Word just says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. The eternal God knew you. He said, before you were born to Jeremiah, I sanctified you. I had plans for you. I set you apart from the beginning. I ordained you. That means anointed, to put his hand of blessing upon to separate out. When we ordain someone into the ministry or into the service of, of being a deacon, a, a, a servant deacon, we ordain them. We put our hands on them. We set them apart. It's a God calling. He said, before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you as a prophet to the nations. God had a plan. We have dreams, don't we? I want you to just think about it for a moment. God has dreams too. You have dreams for your life. All the little girls want to grow up and marry the hunk. Not the hulk. The hunk. They've already decided how many kids they're going to have and what their names are going to be and how they're going to have the perfect life. How many of y'all have lived the perfect life? How many some of those little blessings that you got weren't exactly what you thought they were going to be? Don't act so sanctimonious in the house of God. I mean, Elizabeth and Zacharias prayed for a 
a lot of years for a boy. Or a boy because that would carry on the family name. Probably one of many children. Many children. And they probably thought, oh, they're going to be the most polite, kind, sweet little kids. Smart, respectful. You know, the kind that go around and pick up the neighbor's trash and all that kind of good stuff. And what did they get? John the Baptist. A wild man. Don't you know, they were looking for a boy to be like Zacharias, the young new priest, you know. I bet she made an outfit that looked like a little priest outfit, putting it on him early on, don't you? Of course, he could have cared less about all that. John was the kind of boy, you buy him a new pair of blue jeans and he comes home with holes in the knees. Y'all, were any of y'all that kid? I got more beatings for just being a boy. And mama patched them up. How many of y'all have patches on your knees? Can't you just see the kids in John's class at synagogue school? Teacher, teacher, John's eating bugs again. <laughs> Evidently, he liked locusts. How do you eat one of those the first time? Come on, do you pick the legs off of it? Do you eat it alive? Do you dip it in chocolate? I don't know what you do, but... John was different. Sometimes our dreams, when they come out in life, we put them in the, the oven of our prayers and they come out a little bit different, don't they? But God has dreams too. God has dreams. Sometimes we go through life and they come out a little different, don't they? Abraham. God told Abraham his dream. I'll make of you a mighty nation. But he didn't mean that he made it easy on them. They left the Ur of the Chaldees. They, they, they made the trek to, to the promised land. How are we going to get there? Just follow me. Sounds like Christ, doesn't it? Don't we have a map? I'm your map. I'm the way. How long is it going to take to get there? One day at a time. Just just. Let's walk together and enjoy the journey. Took them all that time to get there, and when they got there, there was a famine there, and they left. And they came back, and they left, and they came back, and they fought battles. Wasn't easy. If you're going to be a mighty nation, you got to have children. I mean, they had their plans. Sarah had her plans. How'd that work out? Not well. The entire Arab nation came from Ishmael. And when the child of promise did come, that's where the Jewish people come. Have they been getting along? Y'all been watching the news? I mean, they, they don't get along too well. You can't get ahead of God. That might not have been the dream that Abraham dreamed, you think? To have a child at 100? Woo! Yet God has a dream. God has a plan. Moses' life didn't begin. I mean, he was, he was raised in the, in, in the household of Pharaoh, but that didn't work out well. He spent, went to the backside of the wilderness where he finally met God at 80 years of age, and God said, now let me enclose and let me show you what my real plans are. We would rather start earlier than that. My, plan, my dreams, my plans, I had early on. But life has shaped them. Now, hey, listen, listen. That's what will happen is our dreams, our will meets God's will, God's dreams, and they come together. And that is absolutely a wonderful picture of salvation. We come with who we are. God comes with the blessings and the promises of who He is. His desire to do more for us than we could ever imagine, to bless us, to keep us, to sustain us, to grow us, to ordain us, to, to, to set us apart for a life of joy and peace and love forever and ever and ever. He just wanted to give all of His best for us. I mean, we could have just settled for 
a little bit less, but God wants to do so much more. Are you listening? So sometimes God will take our dreams, and in this process, He'll take His dreams, and He'll merge them together. That's what happens at salvation, but it continues on from there. It continues on. Yeah, Elizabeth and Zacharias, they, they had dreams, but God says, let me tell you what I'm going to do for you. Look in verse 15, Luke 1. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. I had three children. We prayed for each one. We dedicated them to the Lord. How many of you know as parents, you know, you just do your part, show up and try to love them and lead them on, right? But they are who they are. But we said, Lord, we want these kids to be yours. Use them however you so choose. They belong to you. They don't belong to me. I'll be the caretaker. I'll provide like Joseph did, Joseph did for Jesus. I'll be there to pick him up and encourage him and help him and teach him and love him. I, I, I'll do everything that I'm supposed to do as a dad. But wouldn't it be great, not only as dad would look at them and say, man, they're wonderful. But when God looks at them and says they're wonderful, Zacharias, I just want you to know that, that God said he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He'll be separated. He, he shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. Before he was formed, there was going to be this thing of being a Nazarite. It, was, it would fulfill his mission and plan that God had for him. And there meant there were some things he was not going to be able to do. There are some things that in your life to follow God's dream for you, though others may do that, you may not. And you may want to have a little bit of a tantrum and say, God, but I, I, there's nothing wrong with me doing that. Unless it doesn't fit his plan for you. Are you listening? At that point in time, you got to say what Jesus said. Not my will. Say it with me. Thy will be done. We'll, we'll say it in the old King James. Thy will be done. Your will be done, Lord. What you want. He'll be great. He'll be separated off. Look what it says in verse 15. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. The Holy Spirit will be there to lead and to guide. Hold on. This is pre-cross. Jesus hadn't died yet. This is pre-Pentecost. The Holy Spirit hadn't come to, to live within these new believers yet. But yet the Holy Spirit was still there to be active. When God, oh come on, I wish we could hear this. When God puts us on a mission, He will not leave us alone, but He'll join us there. He will not ask you to do something and then not show up to be there to help you do it. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. He understands, and we learn to understand, we can't do it on our own. So he's good with being there to help us. Verse 16. He will turn many, not all, but he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. We'll talk more about this in a moment. He was the forerunner for Jesus Christ. Verse 17, he will also go before him in the spirit, come on now, and the power of Elijah. Now, at this particular point in time, every Jew, especially a priest like Zacharias, knew the story of Elijah, a man who could be obedient to God could speak to the king what God had laid upon his heart, and it would not rain for three and a half years. Could also show back up and tell Ahab, it's about to get wet. And there's going to be a showdown on Mount Carmel. And by the way, in that, he did what he was supposed to do and prayed a simple, short 
prayer and the fire from heaven fell, hit the exact place that he was aiming for, and let everyone know that the Lord was God, all powerful. You listening? That got, that got Zacharias excited right there. He's going to be what? He will not only go in the spirit and the power of Elijah, but, but this is a quotation of Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. Matter of fact, the last chapter of the Old Testament, the last verses of the Old Testament, it says, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. If there's anything that we need in our world today more, it would be the family to be healed by dads being dads. We have this thing of absentee fathers in our world today that's a shame. There is a term that I pray, I wish had never even been said one time, but it's become a common term. Somebody will say, that's my, that's my baby mama. I'm not married to her, but, but she's just having my babies. And these dads check out, and they step in when they want to and say, hey, maybe bring them a present at Christmas time. But my life is my thing, and I'm doing my own thing, and I don't need to be bound by this thing called marriage or my time with you. Sometimes these fathers have multiple kids by multiple women. Now, now, that's been since the beginning of time, but I'm here to tell you, it's become acceptable in our world today. Morality's changing. And I love the fact that a lot of churches are saying, you know what? We're unashamedly going to go after the men. We're going to target dads. Because if we get the dads, we'll get the families. For years, we've been going after the kids and the parents don't come. For years, we've been going after the moms, and praise God, we've gotten some moms, but the dads stay home. But if you get the dad, the whole family will come. If God would heal the hearts of dads, you would see a revival in our community. Forgive my throat. He said he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. Do you think we need repentance today? When John the Baptist grew up and was preaching, what did he preach a message of? Oh, church, come on. Say it loud. Repentance. Does anybody need to repent today? All of us do. Matter of fact, that's the thing that I've been praying for in my own personal life is that I would have a heart of repentance. I want to repent quickly. I want to see it when the Holy Spirit sees it, and I want to confess it as quickly as possible. I'm stubborn. I don't know. Did y'all know that? And I can be, I can be dull of hearing and slow to act but I want to be quick to repent. And he says, you know what else he's going to do? He's going to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. My goodness, didn't he get them ready? He had people coming to the desert and getting baptized left and right. I mean, he, he was a stir the pot kind of guy. He was brash. He was bold. He didn't, he was not looking to, he wasn't running for office. He was not looking to, to, to see what his poll numbers were. He wanted to be obedient to God. It was his passion and his desire, and God's anointing was there. And when Jesus came in, the stage had been set. The problem was that when Gabriel told Zacharias there this, it, he said in 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 verse 18, how shall I know this? For I'm an old man. My wife is well advanced in years. You know, you notice he didn't tell, say how old his wife was. He wasn't stupid. And the angel said because of this in verse 20, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place. You're just going to have to be quiet. 
Isn't that what they said to Moses? Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Be still and know. Sometimes we just need to slow down, stop, put our eyes on our Lord and see exactly what it is that He's doing. And whatever He so chooses to do, we need to say, yes, Lord, yes. Can I show you all a verse that blessed my heart? Y'all know we've been going through Kings and Chronicles on Wednesday night. It, this is in 2 Chronicles chapter number 16. There, there was a guy by the name of Asa who was king over Judah. And, and it said about Asa, he was a good guy. He was a good king. He tried to do the right things. But there was an area that he came up short in. When he was being attacked by Israel, instead of going to, the, to God and asking for help. I'm getting like them old-timey preachers. I'm coming out of that thing. Instead of going to God and saying, Lord, this is the trouble. This is our need. We come to you. That would have been wise. What he did was he took the money and got the, the king of Syria, Ben-Hadad, and said, would you attack Israel from behind? Break your treaty with them so that they will leave us alone. And in that moment, 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse or 16, verse 9. This was God's word back to him. I love this verse. Love the Old Testament. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, everywhere. God loves everybody the same. He's looking for anybody, anywhere who will do this. He is looking to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Anybody had any issues, troubles, things called life? Anybody had any questions? I got a phone call yesterday. It, it, it was a, a phone from Gastonia, North Carolina. How many of you don't want to pick up the phone when it says Gastonia, North Carolina? I don't have anything against Gastonia. I just don't know anybody in Gastonia. So guess what? Yes, I repent in front of all of you. I didn't answer it. I'm tired of spam. And they left me a message. And I went, well, bless God, they left me a message. So I listened to the message and I called them back. They wanted help. And I'm all right with that. Anybody need help? Anybody in here ever had troubles that you've gone through? Some, anybody ever been kind of stepped on by life? I'm all right with that. But you know, people call me all the time, and they go to God as a last resort. Because I might come through a little bit more tangible for them and they're going to have to pray and live by faith to trust Him. How many of you know that God works in His time? How many of you know He's not late, but He's never early? And that time of waiting is not the most fun time. How many of you know that there's a dream that you've had that you've been dreaming and you've been waiting, you, you've been anticipating, you've been longing, you've been pleading, but it hadn't happened yet? And God is doing the same. God is saying, there, I'm looking. Is there anybody who will just trust me, be loyal, who will come and, and bring their issues to me and we'll have, we'll meet there. That's what I did with my sin when I came to salvation. Amen? God came, wooed me. I, I knew my sin, and I repented of my sin, and I came and I met God. And by the way, it's been good ever since then. Better than I deserve. Well, 
Now Zechariah is mute. And he leaves, goes home, and cannot tell his wife what he saw in the temple. Wouldn't you be excited to go home and say, Honey, I saw Gabriel. You saw who? I saw the one who stands in the presence of God. And he had a word for me. We're going to have a boy. But you know what he came home and said? And a husband being with his wife. And you know what was in the back of his mind? Could this be? Could this be? And Elizabeth got pregnant. Look what it says in verse number 24. Luke 1, 24. After those days, his wife, Elizabeth, conceived. She held herself five... Uh, she hid herself five months, saying, Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. Oh, it was good. It was good. Now, wonder what's going through Elizabeth's mind. You know what she probably prayed? About time. No, I don't think she said that. I think she said, Oh, God, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for taking my barren state and honoring me. All praise, glory, and honor unto you. I think she had an old spell, like the old preachers used to talk about. I think she may have liked the old, uh, old prophet, old King David. She may have just danced around a little bit, lifting up her hands and praising God. Hey, by the way, y'all can do that. If y'all do it in the middle of the church service, I might say, what are you doing? But have y'all ever had a good time with the Lord? Let's fast forward. Verse 57. Now Elizabeth's full time came for her to be delivered. She brought forth the son. Her neighbors and relatives heard how the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. So it was on the eighth day that they came to circumcise the child. I mean, that's the way they did things. And they would have called him by his name of his father, Zacharias. His mother answered and said, no, he shall be called John. Now, hold on. Zacharias was mute. He could not tell her that that's what Gabriel had said. But I believe God has a way of speaking to her too. So she said, his name's going to be John. They said to her, there is no one among your relatives who's called by this name. Don't you love it? They're telling the mom what she can call her child. So they made signs to his father what he would have called him. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote saying, his name is John. And they all marveled, but hold on, it gets better. Immediately, his mouth was opened, his tongue loosed, and he spoke. And the very first thing that he, he didn't say, I knew this for a year. I saw Gabriel. No, the very first thing that he did, the very first words that comes out of his mouth, what does it say at the end of verse 64? What is he doing? Praising God. Praising God. <laughs> and it doesn't say how long he praised God. But that went, not only did it bless him and it blessed his wife, but fear came on all who dwell about them. That means, that means he's got their attention. It, it, this is the fear of God. There is something special that's going on here. And he says, and, and all these things were discussed throughout all the hill country. You can't keep a secret. Not when it's a good one. And all those who heard him kept them in their hearts saying, what kind of child will this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. And his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. Yeah, can we, can we look at this? I want you to hear what John, excuse me, what Zacharias says. He got a baby. He got a baby boy. How many prayers? And my goodness, did he get a baby boy. He got a humdanger of a wound up child. And he said, blessed is the Lord God of Israel. 
For he has visited and redeemed his people, God's people. You know the very first thing he's doing here? Do you notice this? He is not talking about how good things are with him. He is seeing the hand of God at work. Look, you may have a dream, but God's got a dream. God wants to take... <coughs> God wants to take your dream and sanctify it with His will. And when we do this, it's bigger than us. It's bigger than we could dream. This is in Ephesians 3.20. Now unto Him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that I could ask or think. He has visited and redeemed His people for, and has raised up a horn of salvation for us. You know what He's talking about, don't you? He's talking about Christ. He's not talking about John. He's talking about Christ. In the house of His servant David. And he, as He spoke by the mouth of His holy prophets who have been since the world began. He was there. He knew what the, the, the prophets said. He knew what Scripture said. That we should be saved from our enemies, from the hand of all who hate us, to perform. This is what he's going to do. He's not going to talk it. He will perform the mercies promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. God made a promise. God will keep his covenant. He will keep his promise. We'll be the benefactors of it. He said the oath which he swore to our father Abraham. Why? To grant us that we, being delivered from our hands of, enemy, of our enemies, that we might serve him without fear. Church, serve him without fear. Our life for him. I don't care what anybody else thinks. I care what he thinks. I will get beyond my insecurities because I'm secure in him. I'll get beyond what I think because I'd rather walk in his wisdom. In holiness and righteousness before God all the days of our life. Now it changes. And you, child, probably holding him in his hands, will be, the pro will be called the prophet of the highest. Wow. What Malachi prophesied, Zechariah is holding the promise. For you will go before his face. You will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation to His people by the remission of their sins. Preach repentance. God will save them through the tender mercies of our God with which, I love this phrase, I love this title, the day spring from on high has visited us to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Oh, what a God we serve. Oh, what a Father we have. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a salvation. Oh, what rich grace. How faithful He was to come. Discipline is not doing what we want, but doing what we should do. And all the things that we should, that we say that we won't, we'll not do that. But we'll do the things that we should do. That's exactly what Jesus lived. It's what He lived and how blessed we are. You know, it still amazes me that God gave us the choice to choose. I know that He knew us before we were formed in our mother's womb. I know that. He gave us DNA. He gave us choice. He says, if you'll be with me, I'll be with you. 
If you draw close to me, I'll draw close to you. If you so want my gift, I'll give it to you. If you do not want this gift, you don't have to have it. If you want to spend your eternity with me, letting me bestow my blessings upon you, it will be my joy to be your joy. But if you would rather have your way, I understand that our God is always in present tense. But I also know that that means He's in present tense right now. He is the I Am. And He knows everything in your life. He knows your will. He knows your dreams. He knows your desires. And He also knows His plans for you. And how beautiful it is when we can accept those plans, when we can repent of our sins and become a true follower of Christ. <clears throat> it won't always be easy, church. <clears throat> he told them that. Matter of fact, he said in Luke 9, if you want to follow me, you're going to have to die, deny yourself. Take up your cross, follow me. Like a grain of wheat that falls into the ground and dies. And dies. If it doesn't, it remains alone. But if it dies, it grows bountifully. God wants our life to grow bountifully. God wants to bless. My prayer right now is the Holy Spirit, with the power of His whisper to you, that He will let you know that He loves you. He has wonderful plans for you. That He wants your next days to be your best days. He wants to take your dreams and sanctify them, multiply them. But you're going to have to let Him. His eyes are looking for someone that will trust Him, that will be loyal to Him. He wants to come with His power. Would you let Him?